Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and that's right. We're here again to study verse by verse. Amen. And I went ahead and put a whole bunch up here because there's a lot to get into, and I'm very much looking forward to our verse by verse Bible study here. I did take a week or two off because there's a lot to get into, and a lot of times I need more study time. Uh, boy, the time is flying by so quickly. But we have done a lot of studying verse by verse through the New Testament. And I would like to say first, please, if you want to study the Bible, King James Bible, verse by verse, go to my website, thecloudchurch.org. That's thecloudchurch.org. And uh, make a click there. Click on verse by verse. And you will see that we have studied verse by verse through already now, I believe, 22 of the 27 books of the New Testament. In the New Testament, there are 27 books. In the Old Testament, there's 39 books. So there's 66 books all total. And we have been going through the New Testament, and I tried to do them in order. Do you realize the New Testament is not in chronological order of when those books were written? So what I did is I tried to show you when I thought those books were written. Clearly, I believe the book of James. Now, these are all the ones we've studied so far, okay? In red are the books that we haven't studied verse by verse yet. But we will start today on this one, the book of John. But we started going through First and Second Thessalonians, because I believe those were probably written very early. But I showed you how I thought the book of Hebrews was probably written first by Paul. That just makes sense, because he's writing to Jews. And you read the book of James, well, the book of James says, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. If you know the book of Acts, then you know it's a transitional book from Jews to Gentiles, from Israel to the church. So it just, it's just kind of a no-brainer. Well, that makes sense. And then we see the doctrine and the transition in the book of Acts to Romans through Philemon, the uh, doctrine of Paul, the heart of New Testament doctrine. So we've studied James, we've studied Hebrews, we've studied Romans through Philemon, we've studied the book of Acts, all verse by verse. Then we went to 1st and 2nd Peter, then we went to 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, then we went to Jude, and we studied all of those books verse by verse. And that comes up to 13 and 5, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 books that we have studied so far, verse by verse. What a blessing. So a lot of people have said, well, Brother Breaker, now go to the book of Revelation and teach Revelation verse by verse. And I'm like, I want to. I want to get there. And eventually we will. But I felt like we needed to come back to John first. Because we were studying 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, written by John. Well, John wrote Revelation, but John also wrote the Gospel of John. So before we look at the last thing that John wrote, Revelation, maybe we should look at the first thing that John wrote. That was my thinking. So I said, let's do this. Let's go to the book of John first, study that verse by verse. And so, Lord willing, that's what we'll do today. Now, I find this very interesting. You know why? Here at the beginning of the section in our Bible called the New Testament, we have four retellings of the same thing by four different authors, and they're all telling about the same story. Well, that's what the book of Revelation is, only it's one author, but he goes through and talks about end times events, and he retells it four times, from my understanding and reading of the book of Revelation. So, what an interesting thing, the New Testament in our Bible it begins with four tellings of the same thing, and then it ends with four tellings of the same thing. So, I just, I find that very, very very interesting. So we're going to start today in the Gospel of John. Now we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and those are the Gospels. Now I have a video on YouTube if you'd like to see it called How the Gospels Portray Jesus Christ. And it's very important that we understand that Matthew portrays Jesus as the King of the Jews. Mark portrays Jesus as the servant of God, God's servant. Luke focuses in on Jesus as the Son of Man, and John focuses in on Jesus as the Son of God. Now, why do I point that out? Well, a lot of people say, well, it's so redundant. Why do you have to have foretellings of the same thing? Well, the Bible says in the mouth of two are more witnesses, right? So having more than two witnesses, it's certain that a thing is true. So here we have four witnesses of the same events. Now, I went ahead and wrote this over here, the Gospels, okay? We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the thing that's amazing to me is how these four men could present their viewpoint, and each one of them gave us something a little bit different from a different perspective. It's all about the same events, but from their perspective, but yet it's the Holy Ghost in them telling them to write. 
So I believe the Word of God is from the Holy Spirit. Amen? So I believe the Holy Spirit penned these words. But you can clearly see that the Holy Spirit did it in such a way that it's just incredible. How did He do it? He did it in a way that He presents it all from a different perspective or a different viewpoint. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In these books, Jesus Christ is presented as the following. In Matthew, He's presented as the Messiah. In Mark, He's presented as a servant. In Luke, he's presented as the Son of Man, and in John, he's presented as the Son of God. Which, by the way, the Jews understood that if you're saying, I'm the Son of God, then you're saying, I am God. And we're going to see that in the book of John. The book of John is very, very much about the deity of Jesus Christ, of Jesus being God. Not just the Son of God, but being God himself, manifest in the flesh. Now, it comes to the genealogy. Matthew goes to Abraham and says, this Jesus that goes all the way back to Abraham. Mark presents Jesus as, well, he's a man. But we have two natures. When we look at all this, we see the two natures of Jesus. We see the divine nature, and we see the nature that he came born of a virgin as, as a natural man, only without sin. Okay, Born in the flesh. The likeness of sinful flesh, the Bible says, yet without sin. Luke ties the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Adam. What an amazing thing how he could say now, and his father, and his father, and his father, and his father. Now we know the true father of Jesus was God, but the adopted father of Jesus was Joseph. And so he gives you the lineage of Joseph all the way back to uh, Adam, the first man that God created. And we see in another place also, um, we could take the lineage back through Mary all the way back to Adam, if we take these two together. But when you go to John, the book of John takes Jesus back, not to Adam, but before Adam, to eternity past. And John says he's God that has always existed and was from the beginning. So this is so important when we study the Gospels is to see how they all intertwine, how they all fit, and yet how there's differences between them. But why are there differences? Because we're getting a different perspective from each one of them. And it's just, it's an incredible thing. This wasn't just an accident, men writing. This was God giving us this for a purpose. Now, what Jesus did or said, or what, what, what it was that Jesus was engaged in in the Gospels. All right? In Matthew, it was all about what Jesus said. And he's always telling you, Jesus said this, Jesus said that. So it's all about what Jesus said. In Mark, it's all about what Jesus did. Luke is writing from the perspective as a doctor. Remember that. Luke was a doctor. And his writing is what Jesus felt. Isn't that amazing? So one is focusing in on what Jesus said. The other is focusing in on what Jesus did. The other is focusing on, well, this is what he went through. This is how he felt. But John was focusing in exactly on who he was. And he wanted you to know who Jesus was. He's God in the flesh. Come down from heaven. God, the eternal God, the creator of all things coming down. Now, the books of the Gospels, and by the way, we call these the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they talk about the good news. The word gospel means good news. And the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They all mention about how he was buried and rose again, so it's all about the, the good news of who Jesus is. He came as the Messiah. So Matthew ends with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark ends with the ascension of Jesus Christ. Luke ends with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then we see that promise given in the book of Acts. And then John, the book of John, ends with the promise of his return, of the, Jesus coming back, but then shown in the book of Revelation how he will return. So that's why John didn't just write this book. He had to write that book too, because they go together. That's why I felt like we really have to look at this one first before we can go to this one over here. So we've got to study the Gospel of John before we can study the revelation of John. And we've already looked at 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And I told you how, uh, in a lot of ways, we can tie that into uh, Paul and the teachings of Paul. So, now we're going to look at this, and there's a great big question of, does the book of John line up with Paul? <laughs> uh, some of your hyper-dispensationalists say, no, so we don't read the book of John. Well, I think we should read the book of John, and I believe we can rightly divide it, and that's what we're going to do in this Bible study. And there's a lot of good stuff in the book of John. So I want to go through all this, and I want to show you this. Now, let's start here. The Gospel of John. Again, good news is the word gospel. So there's four gospels in the Bible, and they're all about the good news of the coming of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, and how he was the Messiah of the Jews, the Christ. There are 21 chapters in the book of John, 879 verses. 
19,099 words in our King James Bible. Remember, I'm King James only. And if you don't know why, well, go to YouTube and type in Robert Breaker, Why King James? And you'll find several videos there about why King James is the only one that comes from the true text. Now, written by the Apostle John. Remember, he was one of the 12 apostles, okay? Um, one of the first things people do when they get saved, they start reading the book of John, and their first thought is, well, isn't that John the Baptist that's writing this book? No, it begins talking about John the Baptist, but that's a different John. This is a different John. This is the Apostle John. John the Baptist was never an apostle. He was the precursor or the coming before Jesus to announce the coming of Jesus. So John the Baptist is very different than the Apostle John. But John writes about John the Baptist, okay? So there's two Johns. You've got to remember that. Now, a lot of your scholars say that this book was written about 85 to 95 A.D. And I look at that and I go, I don't see that working very well with the book of Acts. And I'm looking at this and I go, no, I think it's got to be written sooner. I, I think anywhere between 40 to 80 A.D. And then that brings us to the discussion of, was the book of John written before Paul or after Paul? And that's a good question. Some arguments make it sound like it was written before Paul. Other arguments make it sound like it was written after Paul because some things kind of tie in with what Paul taught. So it's one of those things that it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of things that you can get in an argument in, and this is one of them. Is this a pre-Paul book or a, a post-Paul book? Well, it's writing about things that happened before the cross. So remember, before the cross is Old Testament. Remember what it says in the book of Hebrews, the death of a testator? So the New Testament doesn't start until Jesus actually dies. So when Jesus dies, then that starts the New Testament, okay? So most of the events in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are all things that are taking place before the cross. So they're all things that are still during the Old Testament time. Think about that. We need to remember that. And what we need to remember is the book was written after the cross. So he's telling you about events that took place before Jesus died. Now, when did he write it? How far after the cross did he write it? Did John write this gospel after he met Paul or before he met Paul? That's a good question. And I think there's some... Um, argument that could be made for either one, but I think the stronger argument, it was written before Paul, because there's some things in it that are more about the who message than the message of Paul, which is what. But there are some things in it, too, that this guy, John, tells us that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not tell us, and they kind of sound like they agree with Paul. So you've got to you got to wonder, and I think I figured it out, but I'll throw that out there let you decide for yourself. I'll just give you my thought about it later as we continue. Now, why was this book written? Go to John chapter 20 and verse 31. John chapter 20 verse 31, John tells us clearly why he wrote the book of John. I call it the book of John or the gospel of John. Why did John write the gospel of John or the book of John? Well, Let's look at John chapter 20 and verse 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So the very reason this book was written is so that you may believe. But what is it that you're supposed to believe? Are you supposed to believe in the blood of Christ? That's Paul's message through faith in his blood. Did he say, I wrote this book so you trust the blood of Jesus? Or did he say, I wrote this book that you may believe? And then he says, believe what? that believe that Jesus is the Christ. So he's writing this book, it sounds like, because he says, I want you to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God. And we're going to see as we get in this book, the fact that he's calling himself the Son of God, he's really saying, I am God manifest in the flesh. Because that means he came from heaven, he was the eternal one, and so God the Father, in a sense, is his Father in the sense that the father planted the seed of Jesus into Mary so that he could be born. So, But who was born? God. So he calls him on the earth the father because he's the son, but he's also God manifest in the flesh, the two natures, the dual natures. So he is the son of God in his relationship to God, but he is also God manifest in the flesh. So in our relationship, looking at Jesus, we go, man, that's the Christ, but that's also God. And so God came down from heaven and died for us. But look at it says, and that believing you might have life through his name. So he's all about the name of Jesus. Here we go back to this, this teaching of the name, the name. What's, what's all this thing about the name? Okay? 
So I want you to get a hold of that. I call this the Who Gospel, right? And we've looked at that before, and I've looked at the difference between the Who and the What of salvation, and we will probably talk a little bit more about that today in this teaching. So I want you to understand, this book looks like it was written more for Jews so that they as Jews would believe that Jesus was their Messiah. But there's a lot of emphasis in this book about salvation by believing. And who put the emphasis on believing? Paul. Faith. So it's, it's one of those things where this book has kind of a double application. <laughs> applies to Jews, hey, you need to believe who Jesus is, but we can take the belief part and say, yeah, that lines up with Paul. We're saved by believing today, so wherever it says believe, but we're, we're injecting that back into it, and we're saying believe in the blood. But if you read the book itself, it's literally saying, no, faith in who Jesus is. Well, believing in who Jesus is, is that what saves us today? No, it's believing in what Jesus did. It's trusting in the atonement. So, we have a little bit of problem with the book of John, but not exactly, if we rightly divide. I don't have a problem using the book of John for gospel tracts and things like that, because it says, believe and you'll have eternal life. Well, yeah, that's what Paul taught. But it doesn't tell you to believe in what. So we go from Paul, we say, now we inject Paul back in it, and we say, now that belief today is believing in the blood of Christ. So it's really a, a, an amazing book. There's a lot of people out there today that love the book of John, and they love the book of Romans. And so uh, many printing presses uh, will print a John and Romans, and they will only print the book of John and the book of Romans, rather than print the whole Bible. Because John is written so that you believe who Jesus is, and then Romans is written from Paul that you would believe in what Jesus did for you, and you would trust in what Jesus did. So you got the who message and the what message. And those, those are good to go together. It's not who Jesus is that saves us, but it's certainly trusting in what he did. Well, what did he do? He died for our sins. Who? God. So it's good to know who Jesus is. He's God manifest in the flesh. Once you get that down, now understand, hey, look what God did for you. He had to shed his sinless, innocent blood for your sins to pay for your sins to save you. Now, do you accept what God did for you? Yes or no? So the book of John is an amazing book. And it's all about, and the theme is, believe and have eternal life. He goes into eternal life a lot and talks a lot about eternal life. Much, much more than uh, many of the other. Uh, we'll, we'll look at this here in a minute. But he goes way more into eternal life than the other ones. Now the takeaway that I get from this book, and I'll try to explain this a little bit more as we continue, is that Jesus gave more info to John than to the other twelve disciples. And as we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's a lot of things that are in Matthew that are in Mark and that are in Luke. And sometimes there's some things in John that are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you ever get a chance, I think it's called the Synopsis of the Gospels or something like that, and they sell a book and, and they show you, well, this is in the other two Gospels, this is not, this is only in the other Gospels. And so there's lots of stories, and some of the stories are in all four of the Gospels. Then there's some stories that's only in one or two of the Gospels. Then, but then there's some stories that John gives that aren't at all in the other Gospels. And so you look at that and you go, what, what's, this, what's the deal? Why is John giving us more information than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Well, I believe there's a reason for that. And I believe the reason is God, Jesus Christ, would sometimes do this. Hey, John, let me tell you this. Kind of like whispering to him. And would tell him things to him directly that he didn't say to the other apostles. And there must be a reason for that. Why do you think that could be? Well, I'll get into that. I'll, I'll try to show you that from the Bible, why I say that, okay? And I think if you look at it, you'll go, oh yeah, that makes sense, Brother Breaker. Okay, I'm not reading into it. I'm not making up my own teaching. I'm just reading the Bible, and I'm going... Jesus gave more info to him. That's why we have more info in John than we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now the question is, why? Well, that's a good question. But we also understand that there's more given to Paul later. So God is revealing some things to the apostles. But while they're here on earth, he's giving a little bit more to John than to the other eleven. And then after, when the Jews reject him in the book of Acts, then he gives a little bit more to Paul. And then once the doctrine is set in stone of the church, God goes back to John one more time and says, now, go ahead and write this book of Revelation. And then there's the ultimate, the final revelation, and the final thing where God says, now. So he gives to John even more 
farther out. So John is an interesting character. And so there's some important information that we can gather and glean from John. But a lot of John is about believing who Jesus was. That would be more of a message to the Jews, believe in the name. But believing is what saves us. So as we read through John, we can put the emphasis on the believing, but then remind people now, believing in the blood today is what saves us, not just believing in who Jesus is. Does that make sense? I hope it does. <laughs> so the theme of this book is belief. And when you believe, you get eternal life. All right? Believing is key to the book of John. But when it was written, it was all about believing who he is. It wasn't the message of believing what he did. So that makes me wonder if it wasn't written before Paul. Or maybe it was written after Paul, but it was written after Paul, and then he's writing it more to Jews so that they would believe who Jesus was so that then they could come around and believe in what Jesus did. So many questions. So we look at the Gospels, we looked at how they portrayed Jesus. Now, we'll just go ahead and dive into this. Let me just read verse 1. So for the sake of, of saying we studied a verse today, we got through verse 1. Now we'll probably come back next week and we'll start again in verse 1. But I didn't want to make this a separate video and call it the introduction. I want to make this, we'll just call it uh, John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus Christ is God. Who was he? Who is he? He is God manifest in the flesh. He is come in the flesh, we saw in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. So he clearly puts the emphasis on who Jesus is. And from the beginning of the book, it's Jesus is the Word, and the Word is God. And then in verse 14, way down there, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So there's your virgin birth. There's Jesus Christ coming in the flesh, and he is God come in the flesh. So John has many more details in this book than Matthew, Mark, or Luke. The question is, why? Well, here are my thoughts, and this was what I said, the takeaway. Whenever the apostles were with Jesus, the early apostles, the disciples, we read in the Bible over and over and over that John was the younger of the disciples, and oftentimes he was closer to Jesus. As a matter of fact, there were times he would lay on Jesus' breast. He, he must have been kind of a younger guy who looked up to Jesus like a big brother, and he would just come over and just lay on him. And so picture that. Here's Jesus, and a guy's laying on his chest. Well, Jesus is going to say things to him kind of in a whisper. Hey, man, let me tell you this, that the others might not have heard because they're closer they would have heard. You say, I think that's a little far-fetched, Mr. Breaker. Okay, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Let me show you something. John chapter 13 and verse 21. That's why I personally think there's more in the book of John than in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because there were more things told to John, personally, one-on-one, -on -one, that John remembered that the other disciples didn't hear. And I think I can prove that from the scriptures in John 13, verse 21. Let's read verse 21 to 28. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Now, who would this be? Judas. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now we read in other passages, the, the one whom Jesus loved is this John. Okay, So John is laying there on his bosom, if you will. John is sitting next to Jesus and he's just finished eating. They're, they're eating here and he just kind of puts his head on him. It's just like, Jesus, I love you, man. And, and so that's why he must have been way younger than the other apostles. Uh, but he, he was laying on him. And because of that, Jesus was right there. And it sounds like Jesus would whisper in his ear some things sometimes that the others didn't hear. He said, why do you say that? Well, let's read. Let's continue reading. Verse 23, the other was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom he loved. We know this is John. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. So here's Peter sitting across the table. He's like, ask. You know, he's probably going, ask, ask, ask. You know, like that. And so, look what happens next. Then he lying on Jesus' breast, saying to him, Lord, who is it? He didn't go, Lord, who is it? He didn't yell. So it's a big table. There's 12 people eating. So he probably kind of whispered, Lord, who, who is it? Now watch what happens. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop. When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Okay, so now a lot of people saying, well, Jesus said that. Jesus went, it's who I will give the sop to. And everyone heard that. 
But that's not what it sounds like in the context. Let's read the rest of the context. It sounds like in context, he says, Lord, who is it? And Jesus goes, the one I give sop to. And the others didn't hear that. Let me show you that. All right, let me, let me give you that here. So, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, doest quickly. Now, verse 28, now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought because Jesus had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Then he having received the sop went immediately out and it was night. Do you see the context? So the context is Peter going, ask him, ask him, you know. And so he goes, Jesus, because he's laying on his breast, who's going to betray you? And the context makes it sound like, whoever I give the sop to. He just whispers in his ear. And then he, bloop, bloop, here you go. And then he gets up and walks out. And everyone's going, why is he walking out? Why would they ask, why is he walking out, if they would have heard that conversation? They wouldn't have asked that. They would have understand. They would have gone, oh, he's the one. But they didn't. They didn't understand why he got up and left. They didn't understand why Jesus said, what thou do. So here we see clearly in the word of God that Jesus would speak to John, sometimes, sounds like, in a whisper, or a one-on-one, -on -one, and the other disciples didn't hear it. Okay? So the takeaway that I get as I read this book is, to me, it sounds like because John was so close to the Lord, he got more information. Many of the disciples were a little farther away. So the closer you get it to Jesus, the more you get from the Bible, <laughs> is the way I look at it. Man, I want to stay close to the Lord. I want to learn more. Let's go over to John chapter 21, here in verse 20. Through 24, we find a retelling of this, and look what it says. John chapter 21 and verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? All right, we just read that. But the others didn't know what Jesus said because they didn't understand why he got up. So when he said it, he said it in a way that only this guy, John, heard it. Verse 21, Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? It's almost like he was jealous. Man, he's always so close to the Lord. You know, he's, he's like the teacher's pet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Verse 24, This is the disciple which testifies of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. John is writing this book, and John is saying, I'm the one that wrote about this. And it's interesting that Peter says, what about him? And Jesus says, what if he... What if he lives when I come? What if he tarries until I come? And they're like, oh, so he's going to live without dying until Jesus comes? Okay, so is John still alive today? No. But you know what's interesting? John saw the coming of Jesus Christ. He tarried. He lived longest of all the uh, disciples or apostles. And guess what? He lived to see the coming of Jesus in a vision. So he saw it and he wrote it down. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this book. This is pretty amazing. But I think from reading this book and looking at this and looking at that as an example, that Jesus gave more information to John than he did to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it was because John was always there, it sounds like a lot of the things that he wrote, he wrote, and people go, but, but it doesn't line up with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Exactly. Because these are all little private conversations that he had with Jesus that he said, oh yeah, and Jesus told me this. Oh yeah, and Jesus told me this. Oh yeah, and Jesus said this. And so he's putting that out. And the other disciples, oh, well, that's what you guys were talking about. <laughs> so they would have wanted the book of John and wanted to read it and wanted to know, yeah, what were those things that you and Jesus were always talking about when we weren't there? You know what I'm saying? So that's how I view the book of John, a little different than the other three Gospels. But a lot of the same events are there but added information. And why would Jesus have said more to John? Well, Jesus knew that the Jews were going to kill him 
And we actually read that in the book of John. He even tells them, I'm going to die, and in three days I'm going to rise again. And old Peter, not so, Lord, you know, and the, and the disciples, no, it's not going to happen. And it did. So Jesus knew the future. So there was probably times when Jesus said to John, hey, um, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and you got to believe this to be saved. And, this, and, and he gave a little extra information to John, and John just kind of kept that to himself and said, mm, okay, okay, and didn't know what to do with it. Until later, and then he's looking back and he goes, oh yeah, oh now I'm starting to see it. So the question is, did he write it before Paul or after Paul? If he wrote it before Paul, well, that makes perfect sense why he's still using the who in the name of Jesus and trying to say, yeah, it's all about believing who he is. But if he wrote it after Paul, that, that would make sense for, oh, so Paul's preaching this now, and it's all about believing. And that, yeah, Jesus told me in private a lot of times, believe, believe, believe. And so, so it's kind of hard to get together when it was written. A lot of scholars say it was written really late, around the time of Revelation. Well, then there should be a lot of things that line up with Paul. Well, there are some, like Jesus being the Lamb of God. What is that? That's insinuating he is the blood atonement. But what if it was written before Paul, and these were certain little hints that Jesus was dropping, little foreshadowing that Jesus was dropping just to John and no one else about how it's going to be under Paul's ministry. So there's several ways to look at this. And uh, I just think it's amazing. So that's how the Gospels portray Jesus. We've looked at that. And Jesus is the Son of God. He's portrayed as the Son of God in the book of John. But portraying him as the Son of God is really portraying him as God. See, a lot of people don't understand. They say, oh, he's just the Son of God. He's not God. They must not be reading their Bible. Because John is presenting Jesus Christ as the Son of God... And that's his divine nature, because he literally, his father literally is God. But now he's also presenting him with his natural nature of being in flesh. And he's the son of man. So he's giving you the two natures. But he is making sure he declares, but I want you to know, he's not just the son of God. He is God. And that's what he presents in this book. Let's go to John chapter 10. So as you read John... Even the Pharisees who were lost, when Jesus came saying, I'm the Son of God, they said, man, you're making yourself God. You're saying that you are God. Well, that's what verse 1 is saying. In the beginning was the Word, the Word is Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word is God. So he starts out his book dogmatically saying, he's not just the Son of God, he is God. So he's telling you Jesus Christ is God. Okay? Do you get that? Now go to John chapter 10 and verse 24. John chapter 10 and verse 24. And it's going to have to be a long passage here, but John 10, 24, all the way down to 39. John 10, 24. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Well, that's eternal security. What's it doing in the book of John? Why is that being said before the cross? Was it only said to John as a foreshadowing, or of a Jesus saying, you know, in the future, it's going to be once saved, always saved. But he says here in verse... 29, but my Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, verse 30, I and my Father are one. So Jesus is saying, I am God, and the Father is God. I came as the Son of God, because God is my Father, so that I could be born of a woman. He put a seed in there. And now I am born as the Son of Man, like he says in Luke, but I'm man and I'm God. I have a dual nature. But he says, I am still God. And I and the Father are one because we are one God. I am God manifest in the flesh. It's the Trinity doctrine. It's the Godhead of one God and three, and those three are one. And the Jews understood that because look what it says next. Verse 31, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? Verse 33, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Now, if Jesus Christ was just a man with a sinful father, he would have had a sinful nature. 
You see, the sinful nature passes down from the father in the blood. The mother, she's just the one that bears you. But the seed is from the man. Well, who was the father of Jesus Christ? God the Father, God. So Jesus Christ came down, and some people call him the God-man. <laughs> um, he came down with a dual nature. He came down, and he is God manifest in the flesh, but he had to have flesh of likeness of flesh, the Bible says. And he had to have, a, so he's man, but he's God in the flesh of man. And so they said, you're saying that you are God? We're going to stone you, you blasphemer. And if he had been a sinner, whose father was really Joseph and not God the Father, then he should have been stoned. But the fact that he is the Son of God, in the sense that God the Father planted the seed in the woman, that he is God manifest in the flesh. So you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. It's one God, okay? One God. So you need to understand that Jesus Christ is God. And the Jews recognize that. And they say, you're saying you're God. Now look at verse 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? <laughs> and then he goes on there and he balls them out because they're running around saying they're gods. Why? Because they're following Satan rather than God. And what was the first thing Satan said? The first thing Satan said is, ye shall be as gods. So they're running around thinking that they're gods here on earth. And Jesus, God, here on earth, shows up and they don't accept him because they want to be him. And then they realize we can't be him. We'll never be as good as him. They want to kill him. Well, Paul later says, guess who they killed? They killed God. And so as we read through the book of John, he's alluding to the fact that Jesus is God. And then he's talking about, hey, guess who was killed? It was God. So it's all about who God is. But Paul made the message about what he did. It's about the blood atonement. But we kind of see that too right? In the book of John, because he calls him the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So it's one of those things. Was it written before Paul or after Paul? I don't know. Was he back writing what he learned from Paul and remembered? Or was he writing this first? And then Paul comes along and then he goes, oh, okay, a lot of what Jesus told me in private lines up with Paul. It's one of those things. It's hard to figure out. But all we know is it doesn't take away from the message of Paul and the message of the gospel through faith in the blood atonement of Christ. So, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. Is Jesus Christ God? That's the question. You know, I get phone calls all the time, and emails, and comments from people who say, oh, I don't believe in the Trinity. <laughs> and I always go, well, I don't know why you don't. The Bible is very clear. And they say, I just believe Jesus is the Son of God, and that's all. And I say, yeah, but he's God. No, he's just the Son of God. And I say, he's both. Well, he can't be both. Yes, he can. The only way he can be both is if he has a dual nature. Because the book of John presents him as the Son of God, but also as God the Son. As God manifest in the flesh. That's verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus Christ is God. Period. So here we go to Hebrews chapter 1, and look what it says. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So God the Father says, I sent Jesus as my Son. Okay, so God the Father views him as the Son. But God the Father is God, and Jesus Christ is God, so God the Father must view him as God, the Son. That doesn't make two gods, that makes one God. But God can manifest himself in three different places at one time. So Jesus Christ is God. But he's the Son. Now look what it says here. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Verse 5, For under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now verse 6, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. Now verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, who? God the Father saith unto the Son, Thy throne, O God, <laughs> is forever and ever. 
A sepulcher of righteousness is the sepulcher of thy kingdom. Jesus came for a kingdom. He came preaching the kingdom message. He was to be accepted by Israel as their Messiah and to rule over them as the king. They didn't realize he was going to be God himself coming to reign. They thought he was just going to be a man like David. But the Bible says he's God. And God the Father says to the Son, Jesus Christ, thy throne, O God. So is Jesus Christ God? Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't believe that, well, good luck with your heresy. Okay? Because the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but he is also God. And the only way he can be both is if he had a dual nature... And the nature of taking on man, a flesh like man, that's the natural man, only without sin, because he didn't inherit a sinful nature from a father because he didn't have an earthly father. He had a heavenly father. That's why he's called the Son of God. But he also had the divine nature because he was God manifest in the flesh. We call that the dual nature of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is God, and we'll see this clearly in the book of John as we go through, even in the first chapter. Like we saw in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, and without Him, not anything was made that was made. He's the Creator. Jesus Christ is God the Creator. Now, even Matthew, when we go to the book of Matthew, presents Jesus Christ as God. I get so tired of these people that say, I don't believe in any trinity, that's a false doctrine, Jesus isn't God. I just get so tired of hearing them say, Jesus isn't God. It just, have you ever read your Bible? Your uh, Jehovah Witnesses do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. And that's sad. That's sad. And that really goes back to ancient Gnosticism. The ancient Gnostics denied the divinity of Christ. Many of them said he was just an angel. They even were so uh, sacrilegious that they said he was a fallen angel. Some of the Gnostics taught that Jesus wasn't God. He was just a fallen angel. Well, what were angels called in the Old Testament? Sons of God. So if he was only a son of God and he wasn't God himself, then we have a problem. Jesus was a fallen angel. No, no, he wasn't. He was God manifest in the flesh. And we go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23 and look what we see. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So Jesus Christ is Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. So here was Jesus Christ, God with us. The Germans would say, Gott mit uns, God with us. Matter of fact, I hate this, but Hitler's troops, their belt buckles, Gott mit uns, God with us. They were saying, God's on our side. No, he, no, he wasn't. No, no, you guys were on the other side. But they wanted to believe, you know, God was, was part of their cause and stuff. Well, he wasn't. But uh, God with us is what Emmanuel means. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 9, because this is a quote from Isaiah chapter 9. And it's all about a virgin. By the way, new versions of the Bible changed virgin to just a young maid. Well, there you go. They took away the miracle. It's a miracle for a woman to have a baby who's a virgin. It's not a miracle for a young woman to have a baby. That happens every day. So watch out for new versions of the Bible that take away the miracles of the Bible. But in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, look what it says. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. All right? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. 1 Timothy 3.16. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Matter of fact, new version of the Bible changed that too. Oftentimes they say he was manifest in the flesh. Who's he? We don't know. But if you have a King James Bible and you have the right text, the text is receptus, it says God was manifest in the flesh. Who would want to take away from the fact that Jesus is God? Oh yeah, Satan, devils, uh, Gnostics. Don't we remember what we studied in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John? That when he's talking about you must believe that Jesus is come in the flesh and that demonic spirits and devils don't want to say that Jesus is come in the flesh. What is he saying there? He's not just saying that Jesus was born. He's saying that it is the fact that Jesus is God, and God is come in the flesh. That's what he's referring to, that God himself manifests in the flesh. And devils don't want to talk about that, because they don't want to recognize Jesus as God. Thomas's confession in the book of John, chapter 20, and verse 28, he says, My Lord and my God. So even Thomas says, okay, all right, Jesus is God. So why are there so many out there today who don't believe that Jesus is God? Well, 
the only conclusion we can come to from having already studied 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is that they are led by demonic spirits. And he says that there are spirits out there. He said to try the spirits, believe not every spirit. And the spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that he is God in the flesh, is the spirit of Antichrist. So if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God, come in the flesh, then you're being led by evil spirits to go against what the Bible teaches. And I would encourage you to repent and uh, to get right and believe what the Bible teaches because the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is God. Okay? Um, is come in the flesh. I like how the King James says Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. New versions say did come or, or was come in the or, or has come in the flesh. Why do they make it past tense? Is he still in the flesh? Yeah. He's in a glorified body up in heaven. <laughs> so he's still in the flesh. But guess what? When I got saved, he came into me. And Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 says, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that spirit is the spirit of Jesus Christ. So I have Christ living in me. So guess what? He is come in the flesh. Guess what? He's in my flesh. So it's still a present tense. Everyone who's saved in the church age has Jesus in them. So Jesus is come in the flesh. You see why demons don't like that? Oh, they hate people being saved. They can't stand someone having the Holy Spirit in them. They want to get in them instead of the Spirit of God. So do you see why we have to stick with the King James Bible? New versions go through there like a bull in a china cabin and just change all this stuff. And they're taking out sound doctrine that points to Christ being God. And when you're saved, you have God living in you. He is in your flesh, so he is come in the flesh. Lots of other verses Paul talks about in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Whose blood? God's blood. So the blood of Jesus Christ is the blood of God, the creator that was shed on the cross. I found this today, just thought this was very interesting in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7, the devil is tempting Jesus Christ. And look what Jesus says. He just quotes scripture. He doesn't just talk to the devil. He just quotes verses at the devil. And rather than saying, devil, I'm going to say this right here. He doesn't say, devil, don't tempt me. Notice what he says. He goes to a Bible verse and he quotes it verbatim. And look what it says. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What is Jesus saying? He didn't say, devil, don't you tempt me. He said, devil, don't you tempt the Lord your God. What's he saying? He's saying, devil, you know I'm God, manifest in the flesh. And you know the Bible says you don't tempt God. I'm God right here looking right at you. And I will not bow down to you. You bow down to me, buddy. So Jesus Christ said he was God. Paul, John, Thomas, uh, Matthew, Isaiah, they all said that Jesus Christ is God. So either you believe it or you don't. So is Jesus Christ God? Yes, no doubt. He has a dual nature. He has the divine nature. His father was God. But he has a human nature because he was born of an earthly woman. And that's how he can refer to himself as both the son of man and the son of God because of that dual nature. So Jesus Christ is God. But more than this, he was God who died in our place for our sins as the blood atonement for our sins. And this is alluded to by John. Go to John chapter 1. So this is amazing to me that there's a foreshadowing given here. And in John chapter 1, he records John the Baptist's coming. And one of the other Gospels records John the Baptist, but he doesn't have John the Baptist saying this. Why didn't he have John the Baptist saying this? Why is John the only one that records that John the Baptist said this? Interesting. Because it must have been on his mind. He must have realized, oh yeah, that's important. I remember him saying that. Yeah, I need to write that down. Now, is that because he remembered Paul? So it's written after Paul? Or is that the Holy Spirit saying, write this down before Paul, because it's going to be important later? <laughs> it's one of those things. But in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day John, this is John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 36 also. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. So twice he says that Jesus, right here, Jesus is going to be the Lamb of God. He said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now why is he calling them the Lamb of God? Um, well, I believe the Holy Spirit is inside the prophet, and he's prophesying. And he's prophesying of Jesus being a lamb, 
And the lambs sacrificed in the Old Testament were types of the sacrifice of Jesus. Because in the Old Testament you would sacrifice a lamb for the forgiveness of sins. So here we have a foreshadowing of the coming teaching of Paul. Hey, make sure you trust in Jesus and what he did. Because as a lamb, he died in your place for your sins. So... Lots more that we can get into here, but Jesus is presented as, as the coming lamb. Hmm. Now, Jesus was God, and the fact that he could do miracles proved he was God. And the book of John is full of many miracles. Uh, Jesus, as God, was able to give eternal life. Why? Because Jesus is eternal life. I was going to read to you 1 John 5 and verse 20, I believe it is, the last verse of chapter 5. Speaking of Jesus Christ, 1 John 5, 20. But I didn't get a chance to go there. If you get a chance, read 1 John 5, 20. Jesus Christ is eternal life. Why? Because Jesus came from eternity past, because Jesus is God, manifest in the flesh. So if Jesus is eternal life, then he can give you what he is. He can give you himself. And so there's a lot in the book of John about believing and receiving eternal life through Jesus. I just, for funds, looked up. The word believe shows up 52 times in the book of John. The word believeth, 17 times. The word believest, three times. The word believing, one time. So the book of John talks about believe many, 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 many times compared to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They might use the word once or twice, but it's very seldom and not even close to as many times as the word belief is used in the book of John. Why is that? Well, because John is trying to focus in more on, okay, here's who Jesus is. Now you need to believe. You need to understand and you need to believe it. Because he was dealing with a bunch of people that didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah or God. So he's writing this book to convince people who Jesus is. And he alludes to what Jesus did or would do as the Lamb. But he's not giving the same message of Paul as trust the blood. I haven't found yet in the book of John where it says, trust the blood of Christ. But that was Paul's message. But as we go back and read John, knowing what we know now, we can see the foreshadowing. We can see it pointing to Paul's message. Hey, Jesus is a lamb. Hey, Jesus said, I'm going to die for the world. Hey, the Bible says God the Father gave his only begotten Son so that the world might have everlasting life. You know, John 3, 16. So I see the book of John as a great book to read. Because it points to Paul's message. Even though it still might be more back there applying to that, it still keeps pointing over here to Paul. Okay? So don't throw out the book of John like your hyperdispensationalists do. Many hyperdispensationalists say, we can't even read the book of John. I go, yeah, yeah you can, and yeah you should. So why don't you? Why don't you? So the word eternal life shows up 20 times. The word everlasting life shows up 18 times in the book of John. So the book of John is about believing Jesus is God and that he can give you eternal life. But the eternal life in the book of John is through believing who Jesus is, believing in his name. That's different than what Paul taught. Paul taught we trust in the blood of Christ. We trust in what Jesus did. Okay. So John is more about who Jesus is And Paul is more about what Jesus did. And so faith in what Jesus did. But the book of John is more about believing in who Jesus was. So there is a little bit of difference there. But us looking back, knowing what we know, having read Paul... We can look at believing and eternal life, and we can say, man, today we believe we have eternal life too. So it sounds like the early church that was just Jews, they had eternal life when they believed in who Jesus was. But the message changed in the book of Acts, as we've seen, the transitional book. And so now they've got to believe in what Jesus did. And as you read through the book of Acts, you see Peter standing up and saying, guess what I am? I'm a grace believer. <laughs> he says, we believe that we shall be saved by grace, even as they. We believe in what Jesus did now, even as the Gentiles trusted in what Jesus did. Now, I have a whole much more to go into in five minutes to do it. <laughs> but I want to get this introduction done, and then we can start there in our verse-by-verse -verse 
study next time and go more into detail in verse 1 and verse 2. But uh, let's look at this quickly. The message of who versus what. I've got a message on YouTube entitled The Who versus What of Salvation. And I've briefly talked about the difference between believing who Jesus is and trusting in what Jesus did. And I can't help but see that here in the book of John again. Look at John chapter 1 and verse 19. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? So the first question in the book of John is, Hey, who, who, who are you? And they're asking, Who are you? To John the Baptist. And he says, Well, I'm just the guy that's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, making straight the, the way of the Lord. I, I'm the one pointing you to the coming Christ. But they're all about, Well, who is it? Who is it? Now John chapter 8 and verse 25. John 8, 25 says this, Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. He's saying, hey, I was from the beginning because I'm eternal. In the beginning, God, oh, I'm, I'm the one that wrote the Bible. <laughs> I'm the one from the beginning. So it's a, it's a lot about who, who Jesus is. In the book of John, the name shows up 24 times. Remember as we went through Acts and I explained to you the difference between the who gospel and the what gospel? Well, we're starting to see it here also in the book of John. And it's focusing in on who is Jesus, who is Jesus, who is Jesus. So, for that reason, a lot of people say, so we can't apply it to us today. Well, yes, we can if we take the who message and we say, well, John's saying if you believe who Jesus is, you have eternal life. And that was before the transition to Paul. So, if you believe in what Jesus did, you have eternal life. And in both, it's eternal life through believing. So, as I read through the book of John, sure, I can use some of these verses in an evangelistic way and tell a person, hey, do you realize if you believe, you're saved? Okay, what do I believe? Well, I could start out with John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you realize that Jesus Christ was given as your sacrifice? So see, I'm inserting in there a little bit of Paul, but the majority of it lines up with Paul. Believing is what saves us, and it's through the fact that Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice to save us. So, so we can take the message of Paul and, and kind of insert it back into John. That's why we don't have to throw John out of the Bible, okay? That's what I'm trying to get across to you. Now, we go through the book of Acts, and the book of Acts is all about who Jesus is. And I don't want to go into that again, but look up Acts 2 and verse 21. Acts 2, 38. Acts 3, 16. Acts 4, 7. Acts 4, 10. Acts 4, 12. It's all about the name and believing in the name. So as you go through the book of Acts... It's all about believe in the name of Jesus. What is the name of Jesus? The name of Jesus is Jesus, which J is short for Jehovah, and Sus is saves. So the name is Jehovah saves. All right. So with Paul, the question arises, so how does he save? Is it enough to just believe that he's the Messiah? A lot of the Jews said, we believe Jesus is the Messiah, but we keep the law. And they thought that they were going to be saved by keeping the law and by believing that Jesus was the Messiah. So they had a faith plus works gospel. But Paul goes, um, no, guys, what, what God revealed to me is it's not the law anymore and it's not the works. It's the faith alone that gives you salvation. And that faith is in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that we find in Acts chapter 13. But let me back up again. I'm running out of time. Acts chapter 9, verse 27, 29. Paul, when he begins preaching, he's preaching the who gospel. He's preaching, believe in the name. Acts chapter 10, verse 43 and 48, Peter comes along. He's continuing preaching, hey, believe in the name of Jesus and all this stuff. But then Paul comes along, and Paul goes out preaching in Acts chapter 13, and he preaches something so different that it causes a big stink. And it causes the early church to scratch their head and go, uh, we need to rethink this thing. What was it Paul preached? Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39. Look what it says. Paul preached this, Acts 13, 38 and 9. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, who would that be? Jesus, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So he says, look, forgiveness, this is Paul's message, is through faith in the blood of atonement. It's through believing in the blood that we're saved without the law. What is he saying? Without works. 
So it's believing in what Jesus did to save you. Not what you do and believing in who Jesus is. Paul says that's not it. It's whether or not you have trusted what Jesus did. And when you trust in what he did for you, his blood atonement, then you're justified. Well, Acts chapter 15, the early church comes together. Why? Because there were some Pharisees that believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they were still keeping the law. And they're still thinking, no, 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 it's not just believing that we're saved. We do not believe and have eternal life. We, we still don't believe that yet. We think we have to do good works to get eternal life. Well, the whole book of Hebrews would have been to them saying, no, 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 it's not the works. It's, it's just believing because it's him that saves and it's through believing him that you're saved. So we get the context. But Acts chapter 15, a certain man which came down from Judea taught the brother and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So works gospel. And the church was like, What? Verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. So the early church is going, well, all we understand is that Jesus is the Messiah, and we all believe that. Now, Paul, you're telling us that the blood atonement is where our faith should be placed in? Romans 3.25, through faith in his blood. You're telling us that we're saved by grace through faith and no longer of works? Let's, let's get together. Let's find out what is... And that's what happened. Now, I don't have time to read all of Acts chapter 15, but I would encourage you to do so. Because there is where Peter stands up in verse 11 and says, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. How? Verse 9. By faith. So Peter says, We're going to accept this gospel of preaching of Paul, that it's faith alone that saves you without works, and that you're justified. And this is the main word. That's so beautiful justified. Justified by faith. So when you look at it like that, and you look back at the book of John, it makes you think, wow, maybe the book of John was written after Paul, because he's making a lot of emphasis on belief. And Paul's all about faith, and faith is believing. But you look at it the other way, too, it's all about who Jesus is, and his name. So, was it written before Paul? And it's all foreshadowing and alluding. You see the problem you get in? So, the book of John, always remember, is still Old Testament until Jesus actually dies. So, all that's taking place in the book of John is taking place before the cross. But, John is hammering hard. It's belief that saves you. And when you believe, you get eternal life. So, he's preaching eternal security. And that's what Paul preaches. So, John is a little bit of a hard book, but it lines up with Paul today, so I don't have a problem going to the book of John and preaching verses on eternal security for us today. Because it sure sounds like Pauline eternal security doctrine. Alright, so there's a lot we could get into, but make sure you know what Paul preached. Paul's doctrine was, we're saved by faith in the blood. That's in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Romans chapter 3, verse 25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So it's faith in the blood. Romans 5.11, what does he say? He says the atonement. In Romans 5.11 says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So you have to receive the atonement by faith to be saved. Verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. All right, so that's the what. And what he did is what saves us, and our faith must be in what Jesus did, his atonement for salvation. Okay? Now, with all that state, the New Testament starts with the death of a testator, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 through 17. So, again, remember that what John teaches in his book, is all events that took place before the cross, before the New Testament, before he shed his blood. But, also remember that Jesus was talking to him in private, it sounds like, and saying, now, it's about believing. It's about when you believe to get eternal life. It's about, And so he's writing all these things that he remembered Jesus told him then, and now we look at it, we go, but that applies now. So it's like Jesus was giving him the Gospel of Paul before Paul shows up almost. People go, no, that can't be because God revealed to Paul. Yeah, okay, God revealed a lot of things to Paul. 
But Jesus also revealed a lot of things to John and just kind of threw them out there little by little. And John would have remembered those. And that's why John wrote them down later. So I see Jesus here on the earthly ministry knowing they're going to kill me. They're going to reject me. I'm going to have to postpone my coming. And so just for fun, he would tell John in private, okay, this, this, and this. And that's the things that John wrote down. And we look back on them now, we say, well, they, they really line up pretty darn good with Paul. The believing and having eternal life. That's Pauline doctrine, eternal security. So no, I don't see in the book of John, put your faith in the blood of Jesus. But I do see in the book of John, Jesus is the Lamb. So that's foreshadowing, that's pointing towards, hey, he's going to die and shed his blood. And in the Old Testament, when they made blood atonement, well, their faith was in the blood because they knew my forgiveness is through the blood. So do you see how it all ties together? When did Jesus actually die in the book of John? In John chapter 19 and verse 31. So many today that we call hyper-dispensationalists say you cannot take the book of John for you today because it's Old Testament still. But I say the book of John is very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the way that John is presenting his book sounds like he's trying to present it more to Jews that Jesus is the Messiah and you need to believe in that. But it also sounds like there's a dual application of John to Jews about that, but also, hey, believe. Because when you believe, you get eternal life and you're eternally secure in Christ. So there's, John is a peculiar book, the book of John. And that is why many, many churches will, will do what they call the John and Romans. They'll print a book of John and a book of Romans, and they give it to a lost person, and their thinking is the lost person will read the book of John and believe who Jesus is, that he's God. And then that lost person will read the book of Romans, and they go, oh, so God shed his blood? Okay, I trust the blood. And so they're trying to get out both the what and the who message through the book of John and Romans. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. So now we can look at John and we can rightly divide it. Not wrong to use Jesus' words that he spoke to John about believing. Because today we're saved by believing. Strong emphasis in the book of John about faith and believing. It says in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to believe him. So God demands faith. It's just now that we know, and we've gone through the book of Acts and we rightly divide, we realize, don't just believe that Jesus is the Messiah or God. Yes, you should believe that. To be saved, you need to know that you need to be trusting in what he did. Trust in the blood. That's what the book of Romans to Philemon is all about. Even Hebrews leads to that too, through the blood of Christ. So we can use verses in John for us today, is what I'm saying. There are a lot of verses in the book of John that we can apply to the church age. Let me give you just a couple of examples, and then I'll be done. I went a little long, but I want to get this out there. Go to John chapter 1, and verse 12. Again, there are people out there called hyper-dispensationalists who overly divide the Bible. And I've heard many of them say, you cannot take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or anything in those books, and try to apply it to today. Because Jesus said he came only to Israel. Well, yes, he did say that. Jesus came in his earthly ministry only to Israel. But the book of John is so peculiar. It's so different. Because there are things mentioned in John that aren't mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's like John is, is telling you information that he got from Jesus. And, and the information Jesus was telling John is it's all about believing. And when you believe, you're saved. And you have eternal security. So you're saved by believing. Okay, that's what Jesus was telling John, and John's telling us. Now, he didn't say, and it's believing in the blood. He told Paul that later. But we are saved today by believing. Okay? So we just take Paul's blood and, and, and enter it back there into the book of John, and then boom, we got, we got a book for us. Yay! We've got a book we can use to win souls, right? But look at John chapter 1, verse 12. Here's an example of doctrine that lines up with Paul. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him... Who's that? Jesus. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. All right, here's an argument that the book was written after Paul, and he's taken Pauline doctrine, and he's putting it back into his account of the retelling of Jesus' ministry. Because he says when you get saved, you get born again. John chapter 3, he gives us a, the story of Jesus saying you must be born again in John chapter 3. So born again, all right? There are some hyper-dispensationalists out there, and they say, no, we're not born again today. Born again is only to Jews, and it's before the cross, so it's a different dispensation. 
And I go, uh, I don't think so, buddy. Because Paul tells us about being begotten or being born again. There's a spiritual birth that takes place when you get saved. And that is being born again. So I look at Paul and I look at 1 John and I go, you know what? 1 John 1.12, that's what happens when I get saved through believing Paul's gospel. I'm born again. And now I'm a son of God. You say, where's that in Paul? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go look. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 4.15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul tells me that I'm born again. How did I get born again? 1 Corinthians 4.15, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So there's a new birth. I'm born again through Paul's gospel. All right? He doesn't mention Paul's gospel over here in John, but he certainly alludes to it in the future. So it's like John is saying, hey, Paul's talking about the new birth of born again. Well, Jesus kind of mentioned in our private conversations something about that, and that when you are born again, you're a son of God. Well, hey, here we are over here looking at Paul's doctrine. We go, yeah, that's in accordance with Paul. When you're saved, you're begotten through the gospel. You're born again. So do you see how it lines up? Makes sense to me. I don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, as some of these hyper-dispensationalists do. I don't throw out the book of John. Let's go to Galatians. So John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, you're born again. All right? I believe that today when we're saved, we're born again. And look at Galatians chapter 4. And in the book of Galatians chapter 4, Paul uses the term born after the Spirit. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuteth him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. There is someone that's born after the Spirit, or someone that's born again. Who is that? Well, according to Paul, when we trust the blood atonement for salvation, then we're eternally secure in Christ, and we're born of the Spirit. We're born anew. We're born again. So born again is a term Jesus coined before the cross, but it's about a doctrine that's after the cross through Paul. So certainly we can go to the book of John and take that and say, hey, that lines up over here with Paul. So it's not too hard to do, rightly divide the book of John, but it is important that you understand Paul first. Otherwise you can get in a mess. And this is what a lot of churches do today. And I better stop here because I've gone long. But a lot of churches get in a mess today. A lot of churches go, no, 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 we don't accept Paul. And they say, we only accept Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, maybe the book of James, and maybe Peter, and some of these, but we do not accept Paul. All right, so what have you done? You've left out the blood. And so now you're coming over here, and I hear this commonly in a lot of churches. Well, if you'll just believe in the name of Jesus, you'll go to heaven. What does that even mean? Believe in the name of Jesus. Jesus, his name is Jesus, Jehovah saves. So I believe Jehovah saves. Okay, I'm saved because I believe that God can save someone. So are you saved because you believe that God can save? God said, I did this for you. And we're even told in the book of John that when he died, he said, it is finished. What is finished? Eternal salvation. So if you come to what Jesus did, okay, it's not just what you do, it's what Jesus did. And you see, a lot of people, they'll take this, book of John, and they'll take only their doctrine from John, and none from Paul, and then they'll make it a do gospel, and they say, here's what you got to do. Come to his name and say, oh, Jesus, I'm a sinner, please save me, amen. And now you believe you're saved because you believe in his name, and you did this. And they make the salvation the prayer you did or you said, and they don't make salvation through the propitiation and what Jesus did. So I make a very big distinction. And I try to show you rightly divided the word of truth. Because there's a lot of good stuff in the book of John. But it's not just the book of John that gets us to heaven. We need to have Paul. Because Paul says that God revealed to him a gospel that is the gospel that saves. So if you know Paul... Then you can rightly divide John. Don't try to go to John without Paul, is what I'm trying to say. 
Because you'll see some things that allude to Paul, but where in the book of John is trust the blood? It's not there. But certainly it has Jesus being the lamb. Certainly it says that he says it is finished. Certainly Jesus is saying you believe you have eternal life. So certainly there's a lot of things, eternal security, being born again, that line up with the teachings of Paul. But if you don't go to Paul, where's the blood? I'm glad it says in the book of John, forthwith came out blood and water. But John didn't say in that book, now trust the blood. But you come over here to 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, he's talking about the propitiation. And now he's lining it up with Paul. So he's telling you in the book of John, here's what Jesus said. And there were some things that Jesus told me that he didn't tell the other disciples. Because the kingdom could have come back then. But it's like Jesus was going, John, I know you better than I know the other disciples. So I'm going to give you a little bit of extra information. Because I know how this thing's going to turn out. I know they're going to reject me over here in Acts chapter 7. I know they're going to crucify me. So I want you to know that the way I have this set up is that when that happens, I want everybody to be saved by faith. And I'm going to tell this guy Paul over here what the faith is to be in, faith in the blood. But I want you to write this in this book and tell people that I offer eternal life to all who will believe. And that's where it all comes together. So that's why you need to rightly divide the Bible and understand. I hope that's been a blessing to you. I hope I haven't confused anyone, but if you have studied our other verse by verse, then you won't be confused. And you'll be like, praise God for this teaching. So next time we'll get more into uh, the book of John. It's going to be a long book, a lot to get into, but there's a lot of good information. All right, God bless you.